Well, praise the Lord. Um, how's everybody doing this morning? We have several out. Um, I know Karen's having to help with the babysitting, and Emmy's uh, in Florida enjoying herself. Uh, she had responded to one of our group texts on the Facebook saying she was down by the beach reading it, so I was thinking, <laughs> yeah, reading the book. So she's, uh, she's having a good time, but uh, how many knows in the Lord we're always a full house? So we're just going to minister and teach this morning. And going into service like we got a full house, because in God, there's never an emptiness or a void. We're almost always ministering to a full crowd. But I just want to open up with a moment of prayer and then get into what I have so we can turn the service uh, over. But, Father, we just come to you this morning, Lord, and just ask for your spirit to manifest in this building this morning, Lord, to, to, to let us be instructed by the Holy Spirit this morning, God, that, that your spirit just begin to reveal itself to us in a, in a supernatural way, Lord, that goes beyond all of our deep expectations and anything else in our mind that we think we already know, Lord, that, that you just begin to renew us in this day, Father, and give us a new revealing of you in a body, Father. So we just ask for your spirit to come forth to speak whether it's words spoken out or just through the Spirit, Father, that it begin to minister out to the body this morning, Lord. For all those that are suffering in pain, that God, let this be teaching be a word of ministry to them, to give them life, Lord, that, that that's why you give us all of these things, Lord, is to minister life unto your creation, God. So we just thank you and honor you and, and, and just praise your name this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So after um, Bobby let me know that... Uh, I'd be doing a teaching. The Lord had begun to lay a certain topic in my heart, and it, it goes along with the foundations. And I've talked some about this before from where I do some groups out there where I work, and uh, it's really about our identity in Christ. And I think that's a foundation that a lot of people really, and even if I think they understand it, I don't think the church world teaches it right, so they don't really get to truly understand who we are in Christ. So I've adopted a, a teaching that, that I do at work to really fit, because what happened, and I've told this before, is I went to a conference last year that was for trauma and addiction and intimacy disorders. And this lady, Shelly Uram, so some of the outline I kind of uh, borrowed from her, and she started giving this spiel about, they call it the true self, that gets affected. And I just started seeing exactly what we teach in this message of reconciliation and in the kingdom message, exactly what she was saying. And I'm up there thinking, I'm like, if she really knew what she was teaching, this would change the whole world of what we're doing. If the world really saw this same message from the perspective that we see, it, it would change everything. And so that's what I hope to do this morning is just bring out a few little things the Lord showed me. And really there's so many uh, parts to this that you could elaborate on so much, but in the time period we had this morning... Um, I'm going to do what I can. I'm also going to recommend a few things because between all the studies that uh, uh, Press and Eby's written and what Bob's written, they've already elaborated on so much of the little parts of this. So I'm going to give some references if you hear a certain part that kind of speaks to you. There's plenty of resources in the kingdom right now to get on and read and to learn and to grow in. Because um, Lord knows we could spend days and hours like so many of these ministries already have just trying to explain something as simple as who we are in God. So with, um, Bob, can you turn that volume down just a hair? It feels like it's, uh, e yeah, it feels like it's echoing to me. Tess, does it sound better back there? Still a little echo. Uh, turn one down, the gain at the top knob, just a hair. All right. So what I have is, like I said, I felt to talk about our identity in Christ. Um, and what the Lord showed me is if you go over, um, this is the first part. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bit of just explaining what I normally teach and bring it into, a, a, bring, in, bring scriptures in to really explain and elaborate on the, what, what it is. So if we look at our first part of ourself, the true self, which we call as Christians our identity in Christ, who we really are, our spirit. That, that part of us that's eternal in the heavens, that part that's always been, that was framed before the foundations of the world in Christ. And just to reference a few quick scriptures, it's in 2 Corinthians 5.1, and I'm using the Amplified Version, and that's the, um, 
for the, uh, the homework. That's what I give him because there's a few scriptures later on that it really gives some key words that it kind of incorporates the Greek language into the Amplified Bible where it really hits the nail on the head in a few places. So 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, dissolved, we have from God a building, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Then you go to Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, and I believe Bob used this scripture. It says, even as in his love, he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, consecrated, and set apart for him, and blameless in his sight, even above reproach, before him in love. In the fifth verse, it says, for he foreordained us, destined us, planned in love for us to be adopted, revealed as his own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the purpose of his will because it pleased him and was his kind intent. So it goes on talking about the true self in those scriptures. It talks about that part of us that was made in the beginning in Christ, in God. And so where I want to go is I want to go over to the next part that talks about so our true self as we know even before the foundation of the world, we were present in God. And even after he laid the foundations of the world, you read the creation story, there's still spirits that are in God. Before a baby comes into the earth, Leighton, before he came into this earth, he was present in God. And there's a certain point where God decided to lower him into this creation. And so that's the next part I want to talk about, really, is about what we get lowered into. As, we begin, as, as it says, we see this arrow that as our true self, it gets lowered into this vessel, an Adamic nature, a sinful nature. And Bob brought out sin, and I know that's a topic that's probably going to be elaborated on a lot here because it needs a lot of clear understanding. But we enter into this physical body. And as we know, we also have a soul. And we're going to elaborate more on the soul. But what happens through that true self? I'm going to come up here for a second because I feel like it's still echoing quite a bit. But as we enter into that, uh, this vessel, we automatically enter into the uh, nature of Adam. Now, and as we've talked a lot about here, we believe that even early on, a child, they still have a contact with that other world. And as we know, we never lose contact with that original place we were in God. But what happens is through things we begin to go through, through genetic lineages, through all these things, we begin to become disconnected from that which we are in God. We begin to unlearn those things that we already knew in the Father before the foundation of the world was laid. And so that's where we look at, um, and in, in the classes I teach, right there I'll put like trauma right there, I'll put addiction, I'll put all these things that we enter into through the genetics. And, but really if you look at it, it's all Adamic nature from our standpoint. We enter into that, which starts creating what they call as deep false beliefs. And I have up there in parentheses, man-made doctrines, carnal beliefs. As we enter and begin to learn the ways of the world, we begin to unknow the truths of God. Now our spirit always, that true self, that it always retains the, the realities of God. It's always in one of, the, one of the characteristics that I really loved when she explained the true self was that it's connected. I believe that true self, that spirit is always connected to God. It always knows the realities of God. But we begin to operate out of that Adamic nature. We begin to know the things of the world. We begin to learn and we begin to govern all of our things by our sights, our smells, our senses. All those things. And it begins to come this deep false reality we begin to live in as we begin to unlearn the things of Christ. And, um, and that's where all these doctrines get, get made up from. And that's one of the biggest things that I think the biggest deep false beliefs that disconnects or puts that veil up. Because we know that the veil was rent. And it, which is a whole other teaching in itself about the tabernacle. And we know on the day that uh, uh, Jesus was crucified, in the earth it was rent. And in the spirit it was rent. There's an entrance into the true realities of God where we can begin to live back out of that true self. But creation up until that point was only able to live out of that Adamic nature. That's why they kept having to atone year after year. That's why they kept having to do these things. They had no entryway into it. Now again, as we keep talking about, this was done before the foundation of the world. The beginning and end was finished in God. But God lowered us into this realm and created this realm because there's still a salvation experience taking place in this realm. So we enter in through those and through all the ideas we begin to uh, get distance more and more through God. Through our natural mind, our carnal nature begins to distance us from God. God never distances itself from us, but that's what begins to happen through our mind, through what we think we know. Until that day 
where as, as, as we ministered already on the, the few teachings, where that reconciliation was before, is, is, it's already done in God. And then there's that calling, there's that, uh, 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 oh, lot, the ransoming that Christ has in our lives, where we begin to re-identify that true self in us. That's that point in our lives. I remember five years ago when it happened, and it's just like, and I hear so many people say that it's like you always knew the things you begin to hear. It's like a part of you just says, I already knew that, but I've never been able to say it like that, or I've never said that. There's a part of you that automatically re-identifies itself in your life. That's always been there, but we begin to tune it out through walking in the world for so long. But that's where that happens, is that true self begins to take back over our being, and we begin to live by the Spirit. We begin to relearn the things of God. Not that we didn't know them, but that they have to begin to become realities in our life in this realm. They've been realities in our life in the other realm, but they're having to take place in this realm. And so what happens is I teach about, we have these true self, and through all the things we begin creating these deep false beliefs about who we are. We begin to, I, I think the world, it's uh, misidentified. It doesn't know its true identity. There, see, there's, an, there's a secret identity in each and every creation. I mean, each and every part of creation in the earth. Every person has an identity within them that they might not even know. And it, and it constantly, I believe that it does operate throughout their life, whether they acknowledge it or not. I believe the Spirit's always in operation. We can't stop that. But it's that certain point where we have that ransom and that we begin to allow that Spirit, that Spirit life to begin to take over and begin, we begin to live out of that instead of our Adamic nature. But with that, with all these deep false beliefs, it begins to create expectations. That if you look at any of the doctrines, if, if, and we've talked about this a lot already, where if our expectation is for one day for us to get to enter into this, we don't have to try to do anything here right now. That's what a lot of Christians and a lot of people have the belief of, is that one day this is going to happen, and that's what they expect, so they live out of that. Which is a deep false belief in God, because it's already here, the kingdom is here, and we're going to talk more about that in these scriptures to come. Because I'm going to get back on some scriptures that show what I'm saying. But whenever we begin to get that deep false belief, that false doctrine, these traumas, these things that are wounds. Because uh, 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 Bob had said it, that I think it was last week or the week before, about a lot of people say, I don't believe in God. But it's not truly they don't believe in God. They don't believe in the God that man preaches. Because it's such a bipolar God. It's such a God that doesn't make sense to their inner man. Because that's what I believe. That inner man identifies that. And they say that's... That, even though they don't know what's going on, I think their inner man stands up and says, that doesn't seem right to me. I don't believe in God then. If that's what God is, is a hateful person in the sky going to judge me for everything I do? I don't believe in that. Who would want to believe in that? And so I believe it starts to create expectations that people begin to live out of. And so to wrap up before we get back to the scriptures, it says, uh, after expectations becomes dysregulation in the body. And so to tie it into the three parts of man, the true self is our spirit. The deep false beliefs and expectations represent that soul realm, that limited understanding that through trauma and psych wounds and uh, damnic nature and all these things that the soul uh, operates out of, then you have dysregulation in the body. And this is what so many people face today from living out of that soul realm. Because whenever you're living out of those deep false beliefs and all those expectations, all you're operating in is that soulish realm. And it begins to cause dysregulation in your body physically. And we're going to relate this spiritually, but in the body, physically, we know that that's where anxiety comes from. That's where the, the depression comes from. That's where the, uh, all the physical and all the ailments, they begin to come through something, whether it's genetics or whether it's through any of these things that cause it. Because I believe, and me and Mike's had this conversation before, I believe if you took a person that's contemplating suicide and they really began to understand who they are in God, that's the only way they can ever get that hope. That's the only way they can ever get that purpose back. That's the only way they can ever begin to make sense of things. Because in the world, they have no place. They haven't found a place in the world. They can't find that. But that's why people are constantly looking for. That's why they get new jobs year after year. That's why they change cars. That's why they change clothes. That's why they change because They're always looking for something. But they're never satisfied until that one day when they get ransomed by God and brought into that spirit life. That's the only way to become satisfied with what we're doing in this world. It's to begin to acknowledge that true self that's within, that inner man that's been present the entire time. But, but through all the things, like I say, the lineages, through the teachings of man, through all this, we become unidentified with who we truly are. And I believe that's what we're here doing these teachings on, is we're starting to learn who we are in Christ. We are sons of God through Christ. 
through our elder brother. We had a gateway into all these things we're talking about. That's where the reconciliation came from. In a scripture I'm going to use, it says, God, Christ, Christ was present in God, reconciling the world. He's opened up the doorway. He's made an entryway into all the things. So I want to back up for just a second and go into uh, Genesis, the second chapter, uh, verses 7 through 9, because it talks about a process of God creating us so intimately. And I think whenever you have to, when it, before you can understand our identity, and a lot of people know the, uh, the, under, the concept of body, spirit, and soul. But what the big thing um, is that we have to begin to realize is there, there has to be a marriage take place. Because as I said, whenever we only live out of that soul realm, which is such a limited realm, our body is never brought into a greater place in God. Because that's what we're looking for is a change overall. A complete change, not just the saving of the soul. We're looking for a full salvation. That's what Bob ministered in that message, a full salvation. So it talks, uh, to read real quick, it says in uh, Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath or spirit of life. How intimate is that? It's saying God actually breathed that breath of life into us. Yes. See, we're a creation like no other creation. We're different. We're set apart. God desired to have a creation made in His image and likeness. And He breathed His very essence of life into us. That's that spirit. That's that true self I'm talking about. His very essence was placed inside this vessel. Yes. And it says, And man became a living being. You see the three parts right there. It says he formed man from the dust of the ground. That's our physical body. We're made of all the elements that you see in the earth, physically. But we're not just that, because animals have that. There's something that has to distinguish us. That's that breath of life, that spirit. It says man became a living being. You see the soul. You see the three parts right there, made in the beginning. And it says, And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, which is delight. And there he put the man who he had formed, framed, constituted. See, there was a process of him molding and forming and doing all this. And if we look at it just from a common sense standpoint, if God is omnipotent, omniscient, perfect, all these things that we say he is, he knew what the end result of this creation is going to be. As soon as he created it, 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 again, we talk about it so much, before he even laid it all out in the earth realm, in the cosmos, he knew what the end was going to be, and that is Christ. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. And it's a done deal. It's signed off on. It's a decree. But there's still a working and a dealings and things going on that people are still having to walk through. But we know where we're headed and that's why we have hope. That's why we live out of that life. Because we know where it's taking us. But we can't become deluded because I think even in a message like this, you can still get those deep false beliefs implemented into what you're seeing. Because your carnal man keeps saying, I don't want to go through the fire. Let me create a belief that gets me out of the fire. We're just going to say it's all done. There's nothing left to do. But that's when we begin to limit ourselves from that true self. Because there's only one way to live out that true self, and that's to be connected to Christ. To be humble, to, to realize who we are. And it says in the ninth verse, And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight or to be desired. Again, you see the body right there. It says every tree, good, suitable, pleasant for food. And then here's the spirit. It says the tree of life also in the center of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of the difference between good and evil and blessing and calamity. So that's a pretty fun, uh, you know, everybody knows the story of Eden. And that's what we see. And Preston Eby, that's what I was going to say. During this part of Genesis, if you really, if it, if it excites you about a part of it, read that Echoes of Eden series that he wrote. Because that's where I got a lot of this. Uh, the Lord revealed so many things to me whenever I was reading that early on. And it just, that's what I say. Whenever I read that, it made sense of things. I was like, I already knew all this, but I've never thought about it in the natural. A part of me said, I remember that. Now begin to live out of that. Begin to operate out of that. Because it changes your perspective. We talk about that. If an eagle flying has a different perspective than an animal that's having to walk through the forest having to walk through the trees. It doesn't see what's on the other side. It only sees a limited view. And so we see those three trees, and as we know, we are the Garden of Eden. 
And I'm not debating today whether there's a, there was ever a physical place, any of that. I'm just saying, let's look at today of we are the Garden of Eden. He gave us every tree of the garden. That's our physical body. He placed Himself right in the midst of us, that tree of life. And He said anybody can freely eat of that tree of life. But don't eat of the tree of blessing, I mean, uh, the tree of knowledge, the uh, good and evil, the blessing and calamity. He says, because in that day you shall surely die. And as we know, they end up eating of that tree, but what happens? They didn't physically die. But they entered into that Adamic nature, that, that, that sinful nature. They missed the mark. And it wasn't just a big accident. Like I said, God already knew the beginning from the end. It was for a purpose. Because He's going to reveal Himself to us like no creation He's ever created knows Him. We're going to know Him intimately. He breathed that breath of life into us to let us have an intimacy with Him. He's our Father. He's not just our Creator. He's our Father. We came from the very essence of what He is. We are not Him, but we are part of Him. And so it says, it told us we can eat of that spirit life, but don't eat of the soul realm. And that's still an order God has in this day. He's telling us, don't eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now we had to experience that to really understand the way God sees things. But we don't need to live out of that. We need to begin to live out of that tree of life that's in the midst of us. Because as we know in Revelation, that's the only tree standing. That's the culmination, that there's the tree of life on either side. And that's what the finish is, is going to look like. It's going to be Christ. All three of those realms brought into one in a headship in Christ. And that's where we're at. We're in that process of that marriage of the body, spirit, soul. And so to read through, um, I may not end up reading all the scriptures that I had, um, but I wanted to really, because Paul talks about it so uh, great in Corinthians, the first and uh, second Corinthians. But uh, starting in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, it says, Awake from your drunken stupor and return to sober sense and your right minds and sin no more. For some of you have not, some, some of you have not the knowledge of God. You are utterly and willfully and disgracefully ignorant and continue to be so, lacking the sense of God's presence and all true knowledge of Him. I say this to your shame. In the 35th, it says, But someone will say, How can the dead be raised? With what kind of body will they come forth? It says, You foolish man, every time you plant seed, you sow something that does not come to life, germinating, springing up, and growing, unless it dies first. Nor is the seed you sow then the body which it is going to have later, but it is a naked kernel, perhaps of wheat, or some of the, some of the rest of the grains. So what it begins to talk about right now is the present state we're in. We see this physical body, but it's only a seed. It's, there's something within this that's ready to come forth and give us a new body. And we had, that, we had that whole message throughout the camp about what a seed needs to begin to grow. And it's so true with what's going on. We have to begin to tend that part of the seed that's on the inside, the, the seed of Christ that's on the inside. Because this is just a vessel containing something. This, isn't, this vessel is not uh, really life as we think it is. Because we say we live, but we don't truly live until that spirit life comes up from, without, from in the midst of us. Because that's the true life. That's that very life that God breathed into us in the beginning. That breath of life. That's still in each and every one of us. But it says um, in the 38th, it says, But God gives to it the body that He plans and sees fit, and to each kind of seed a body of its own. For all flesh is not the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for beasts, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies, sun, moon, and stars, and there are earthly bodies, men, animals, and plants. But the beauty and glory of the heavenly bodies is of one kind, while the, body, while the beauty and glory of earthly bodies is a different. Let me go ahead and skip forth real quick. Um, so going up to the 44th verse, it says, It is sown a natural physical body. It is raised a supernatural, a spiritual body. As surely as there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. And that's what the Lord had laid so much in my heart this morning, is, there, there's, is, is there's those two bodies. There's this old man, 
but there's that inner man. That's the body we have to begin to live out of is that inner man. That's that true self. That's that true identity in Christ is our inner man. That's the one that knows his father. That's the one that understands his father. But we have to begin to take that on in this realm. We have to begin to live out of that. Because there's going to be a change that happens. And that's what he talks about. I'm going to go ahead and skip up uh, to 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. He says, Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. And that process of engrafting, I, I looked that up. Um, let me see if I can find the definition really quick. It's pretty interesting. Mike will probably know this better than me um, about propagating. And that's what it talks about. There's a process of where God has taken that r original seed, or I'll just have to go back and tell it as best as I know it, um, where he's taken a part of that original seed of himself and put it in the midst of us. And what that does is that begins to reproduce after its kind. It begins to, uh, uh, to multiply and it begins to grow. It begins to propagate. That's what it talks about. Whenever we become engrafted with Christ, we begin to receive this new body. It begins to come, it begins to come into a whole. It, it says, um, in the 18th verse, it says, But all things are from God, who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself. And again, that was done before the foundation of the world, the reconciliation. And gave to us the ministry of reconciliation, that by word and deed. And that was another one of why I like to amplify, because it says that right there, the word and deed. So I think there's a lot of word about this today. There's a lot of uh, doctrine about this today. There's a lot of message. But there has to be deed of it. There has to be a working out, a walking out of this thing. There has to be a people that begins to perform it in the earth. Because that's what's always happened in all the moves of God. There's always been a word of it. There's always been a doctrine of it. And there's certain times where it gets moved in the earth. And there's certain moves, but then they get cut off by the flesh of man. And that's what I say. It begins to get those deep false beliefs operating again, where they come up with their own ideas of it, their own doctrines of it. But God is handing us over something right now in this hour that he has control of, that man's not going to get a hold of. And ending with this last verse, it says, It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them, and committing to us the message of reconciliation of the restoration of favor. And that's really who we are. We are ministers of reconciliation. We get to carry this message out to the earth. But again, like it said right there, it can't just be word. It has to be deed. And as that begins to be worked in us, that reconciliation process begins to be revealed in us and that salvation and that, that deliverance and these ongoing workings, the door is already there. Jesus has opened that up. But we have to begin to walk into that. We have to begin to engraft ourselves into Christ. We have to begin to allow Christ to grow in the midst of us, to let that tree come forth. And that's what God, He... he, he he chose to have a multidimensional man because God's going to show not that he had to, he desired to. He's going to show who he is in a people and he's going to use us to do it. He's going to overcome all these fleshly things because our flesh can't stand up to God. That's what it says in a tabernacle. It's not going to enter in to that holiest of all. He's doing away with all flesh to allow us to enter into a place in him that's going to allow this glory to come forth of who we really are. And we're going to begin to operate at that in the earth realm. So I just praise and honor the Lord and just thank Him for, for revealing this to us because what a gift it is to, to, to understand and be receiving a truth like this. Amen. And to continue to grow in it, to not stop just hearing it for the first time and say, okay, I got it. To allow ourselves, that's why I love these teachings, to allow ourselves because we're always going to keep learning something. We might hear something a different way. Somebody else has a different expression of it. So praise the Lord, and uh, we'll just go ahead and go ahead and take our break to get on into service.